The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Hannah Gadsby's Picasso show, It's Pablomatic, opens at the Brooklyn Museum, floods damage Italian heritage, and Ellsworth Kelly's centenary. As It's Pablomatic, Picasso, according to Hannah Gadsby, opens at the Brooklyn Museum, I talked to Catherine Morris and Lisa Small, who've co-curated the show with the Australian comedian. Floods at the end of last month have caused widespread damage to heritage in the region of Emilia-Romagna in Italy. I speak to James Imam, our correspondent in Italy, to gauge the extent of the damage and explore the government's response. And this week marks the centenary of the birth of the great US abstract painter Ellsworth Kelly. This episode's Work of the Week is Kelly's Spectrum 9, one of a series of paintings based on a spectrum of colours made by Kelly across his seven-decade career. Yuri Stone, assistant curator at the Glenstone Museum, where the piece is part of a retrospective of Kelly's work, tells us more. Don't forget, you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from a digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, the new series of which began this week. And do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, Pablo Picasso died 50 years ago, and to mark the anniversary, dozens of exhibitions and displays are opening across the world under the umbrella of Celebration Picasso. Perhaps the least obviously celebratory opens this week at the Brooklyn Museum in New York. Its Pablomatic, Picasso, according to Hannah Gadsby, was partly inspired by Nanette, Gadsby's 2017 comedy routine, which has proved a huge hit on Netflix. Searingly political and personal, Nanette reflects on the consequences of misogyny and homophobia, but also on established narratives about artists, and particularly Picasso. At one point, Gadsby reflects on Picasso in his mid-40s, sleeping with the 17-year-old married Therese Walter, and the idea of separating the man from the art. OK, let's give it a go, they say. How about you take Picasso's name off his little paintings and see how much his doodles are worth at auction? Elsewhere, they declare of Picasso, I hate him, but you're not allowed to. So it's little wonder that the Brooklyn Museum show is among the most hotly anticipated of the anniversary events. To find out more about the show, I spoke to Catherine Morris, Senior Curator of the Centre for Feminist Art at the Museum, and Lisa Small, its Senior Curator of European Art. Catherine, as the curator for the Feminist Art Centre at the Brooklyn Art Museum, it was perhaps a natural place for a show about feminism and Picasso, the Brooklyn Museum, right? It absolutely was, particularly in regards to the invitation from the Musée Picasso, which did, you know, ask us to consider Picasso's legacy in the 50 years since his death and what that means in relationship to the art history that has happened in those intervening years. Right. But it's another thing, Lisa, then to work with Hannah Gadsby, because they very clearly said in Nanette, I hate Picasso, literally those words. So... Tell us about that. What was the genesis of the relationship? Yeah, well, after Nanette came out in 2018, Hannah came to the museum. We were all sort of fangirling, as the term is, because their performance incorporated art history, and we were all very excited about that. And we talked about would it, it would be great to work on a project one day. And so when the Musée Picasso approached us to participate in this 50-year anniversary event that they have helped to orchestrate, we realized that this was the, the perfect combination. It was the perfect opportunity to partner with Hannah. And Catherine, can you tell me something about how you've worked with Hannah in terms of realising the structure of the show and selecting individual works? Because there's 100 pieces in this show. So I'm curious to know how hands-on they were. We really started with Picasso. We really started off talking about the ways in which Hannah themselves conceived of Picasso as a part of a world that was dominated by not just male artists like Picasso, but male dealers and the other support systems that made his brilliant career possible. And um, so part of our earliest conversations, for example, uh, focused on the Vollard suite, 
because of the kind of representation that that joint project with Picasso's very influential and powerful dealer represented in that relationship of building power into what we would today, you know, call the art market. From there, we had conversations about feminism and about the emergence of feminist art history, specifically revisionist history, as it really developed in the years since Picasso died. And we had a really wonderful opportunity to look through our collections and to think about works in our collections that added to that conversation and really expanded on the notions of the way that female artists have simultaneously engaged in learning from, building on, loving modernism, and at the same time pushing back on their lack of availability to be included within it. And Lisa, tell us more about how the kind of art history feeds into this, because one of the curious things about Picasso's art history, if you like, is this balance between those who have consistently analysed the form and, and pushed that side of his work. And then you have John Richardson, who's become the most famous Picasso scholar, if you like, whose biography was so centrally tied to his daily life, you know, saw Picasso's work as a diary in which he would name every individual and every single symbol related to the biography. So do you unpick that in the show to a certain extent? Or in a way, is there an art historical dialogue going on as well as the kind of dialogue between feminist art and Picasso, if you like? Well, I think that, as you point out, knowing about Picasso's biography in sort of granular detail is nothing new. And so it's not as though we're uncovering any new ground as far as that's concerned. I think that what we're responding to in a way is this idea of works of art, whether they are made in the 1930s or the 20s, people are still encountering them right now in 2023. And so they are contemporary in that sense because we're encountering them in a contemporary moment. So, you know, we make no representations and it was never our intention that this be, if you will, a kind of scholarly exhibition about Picasso. That's not the mandate of our exhibition. There are many others this year that that do that wonderfully well and have continued to do that. But rather, we were thinking about the context. And, you know, art history for many years since, you know, is really beginning to attend to all manner of things, whether it's in an art object itself, that haven't been looked at very closely before. And so we are trying to, you know, in the space of the museum, attempt to have or to encourage and invite our visitors to have this conversation with us. We are not trying to suggest an answer to any of these complicated, nuanced questions. We're just creating a space in which they can occur visually and through, you know, the dialogue on the walls as well. Absolutely. And and tell us about the dialogue on the walls, Catherine, because on the one hand, you've got artists who lived exactly contemporaneously with Picasso, but you also got artists who follow him. Do you group those artists chronologically or is it more thematic? It is definitely more thematic. Having said that, there is a loose chronology. To go back to your Lisa's answer to your question for a second, one of the things that I think is so funny, and I think that this is a scientific approach to art history, is that we should go into any major contemporary or modern art library and count the running linear feet of Picasso publications against almost any other artist. Maybe Warhol would be giving him a run for his money and think about who gets an inch and who gets a mile. And that is part of, I think, a driver in this exhibition. And so when we were thinking about how to incorporate the women's artists' voices into the exhibition, we were thinking about thematics. This is not a comprehensive exhibition that pretends to offer some kind of monographic start-to-finish examination of Picasso in a kind of one-to-one conversation. In fact, many of the conversations that are happening with juxtapositions with women artists are about modernism, about the history of modernity, which Picasso is obviously the the sort of ultimate representative of, rather than, as Lisa said, a critique of every one of his relationships that he had during the course of his lifetime, that the biographies that have come out since his death have so enumerated upon. And in terms of the women who were contemporaneous with him, that is a much smaller part of our exhibition, but one that we are nonetheless quite proud of and feel like is a quite pointed moment in the exhibition called Foundation Mythology, where we have a quote by Hannah that says, not all prodigies get to be geniuses. And that seems both a poignant and very pointed description of not any kind of questioning of Picasso's genius, but of the structures 
that allowed him to become one and did not allow others to, women artists specifically. And I think the best example of that that we have in the exhibition is the Katie Colwitz image that we have included. Undeniably in my book, a genius, but clearly never materially or market-wise on par with Picasso. And as Lisa has pointed out, in a lovely kind of coincidence or historical truth, Colwitz bought a Picasso drawing from one of his earliest exhibitions in Paris. And juxtaposed with that, we have three of our beautiful line drawings, figure studies by Louise Nettleson from the 1930s, which was a radical act. In the 1930s, it was still difficult for women artists who wanted to be taken seriously to even find their way into a life drawing class. Those drawings, Lisa, are utterly stunning. We should reinforce that those Louise Nevelson drawings and absolutely you see that engagement with Picasso and that history of, that had been so utterly the preserve of male artists up until that period. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, they're really a, a, have been a revelation, you know, for us um, having them in our collection and some visitors have already commented on them. But the fact that they are these sort of life study drawings of, of nude women in the studio, it, it couldn't be a more perfect sort of corollary or counterpart to Picasso for the reasons that, that Catherine enumerated. Um, life drawing, of course, was the kind of Rubicon that so many women artists were not allowed to, to cross historically um, that prevented them from competing and hers are just stunning and the fact that they're contemporaneous with some of the amazing works that Picasso himself was doing in the 30s is really wonderful and just as a final kind of to wrap a bow on that little moment that Catherine mentioned with Colwitz and, and Nevelson right across from those wonderful works and from Hannah's quote we have a copy of Life magazine from 1968 that has Picasso on the cover to sort of um, drive home that point about his him being the first celebrity artist of the mass media age and how that's sort of the apotheosis of that idea of celebrity that he achieved, the kind of pop cultural institutionalized genius, capital G, across the world. Catherine, is one of the kind of jobs of this exhibition in a way, not to say Picasso is not a genius, but to say, well, it's complicated. <laughs> you know, he's a genius, but also his behaviour warrants attention and his attitude to women warrants attention. Exactly that. And his attitude and his behaviour towards women has warranted attention. I think that this is a conversation that is happening. It hasn't happened in a museum before. <laughs> and so that makes this unusual. It is also unusual for a museum, I think, to be taking an approach to a subject like this, but honestly, virtually any subject that is also framed within humor. And so the ways in which we want to address this question, which is very much part of a contemporary dialogue, is around how we talk about these things today. You know, in Picasso's lifetime, the mythology of the individual male genius was very much accepted, and now it is not. And that, as you very well said, does not detract from Picasso's accomplishments as an artist, but the conversation is one that feels very pertinent and important, and, um, and Picasso will be fine. <laughs> I think that's key, isn't it? And in fact, I know that there's a quote from Hannah saying, Lisa, that, that, you know, this is not a, an attempt to cancel Picasso. You can't cancel Picasso. But what you are doing is, in a sense, deepening the conversation. And, and it seems to me that one of the ways that you do that is, yes, through the Guerrilla Girls works that are in the show, of course, they're vitally important. But looking at the ways in which that territory that he explored has been in itself complicated by women artists over the years of very, very different generations, using very different media and so on. And in a way, this is an incredible rejoinder to the kind of standard art history, that male art history. Yeah. And as, as Catherine pointed out earlier, um, so much of the feminist work that's in the show are really these interventions and rejoinders to modernism writ large, you know, that Picasso is sort of the exemplar of from, you know, the very direct institutional critique, as you mentioned, of the Guerrilla Girls to Hannah Wilkie's amazing early video piece where she does her strip tease dance in front of Duchamp's Bride Strip Bear. So I think it's just really about seeing the ways in which all of these wonderful feminist artists are coming up against this monolithic entity of modernism and sort of finding their way around and through it. 
And having Picasso surrounding this dialogue is just adds another fascinating layer and and something that we have said to each other throughout the course of this, apart from, uh, as Catherine just said, Picasso will be fine, is it's not a cancellation, it's a conversation. And that's really what we hope for with all of the voices in the show, um, from Hannah's voice um, to all of the, the women artists. And I was thinking just earlier, Lisa, during the press preview, what's also interesting about this exhibition, I think, is that we're treating Picasso like an artist. We're treating Picasso like an artist with other artists, not like a god or a figure that is unimpeachable. It is the way that you would treat a living artist who you wanted to compare or talk about in relationship to other living artists. He's in a group show. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Um, Catherine, you you mentioned the the humour earlier on and and I think it's crucial that that's present even just in the titles of the room I noticed that the last two themes if you like are women sort of doing stuff and then powerful women doing powerful stuff tell us about those those come directly from Hannah and they were just wonderful they've talked about the fact that in most modern artwork women get to be naked and sleeping (laughs) <laughs> um, and in fact, that's not all that women do. And so we sort of have been slyly playing on that and just sort of teasing out what that exactly means and, and how that gets played out between an artist like Picasso, who sees a woman as a subject to his vision, and in contemporary conversations, women artists who place themselves not only as subject, but as maker. And what does that very clear distinction mean? And in terms of humor, you know, one of the things that we also are really pushing on in this exhibition is the sort of logical binary of the 20th century of the either or, you know, power culture, male, female, black, white, rich, poor, and really wanting to talk more about both and. And in this case, one of the binaries we'd like to break down is the notion that humor and seriousness are opposites when in fact they're not. And part of Hannah's wonderful addition to this exhibition is a humor that is very direct right? A humor that can say, I hate Picasso, with the intention of opening up a conversation so that other people who might not be so comfortable talking about modern or contemporary art can actually say what they think. I think humor does that. It makes a different kind of space. Absolutely. And and as well as sort of analysing the phenomenon of Picasso, it seems to me that one of the important things that the show does, Lisa, is to say that Picasso's subjects are also subjects that women can explore, as in you've included the Volar Suite, which is obviously, as you mentioned, this sort of seminal group of prints. And the eroticism of that suite is absolutely present in many of the women's works that surround it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the most amazing juxtaposition moments in the show comes early on where we have Picasso's, one of his beautiful reclining nudes from 1932, in the same room with a stunning painting by Joan Semmel, Intimacy Autonomy. And you can really see how Semmel has been working through and against these tropes of the female nude. The idea of how you capture intimacy and whose vantage point is being proclaimed and the other kind of way that it comes full circle that I love, again, with that Picasso reclining nude is at the very end of the exhibition in that gallery where there are no Picassos, uh, just powerful women doing powerful stuff. We end with a, a really extraordinary painting by Micheline Thomas, one of her reclining odalisks that obviously bears a remarkable kind of compositional resemblance to what Picasso is doing. But, you know, she's a, a, a queer woman artist. And, and so there's a really interesting way to think about the female nude in our history and how it is redeployed or deployed differently by women artists than by someone like Picasso. And finally, Catherine, I know that Hannah Gadsby is due to give a lecture called But Cubism at the Brooklyn Museum, almost as this podcast comes out, actually. Do you know yet what they might say, how it will relate to the sort of explosive things that they've already said in Nanette? We don't know. We um, are looking forward to hearing it. The but cubism angle comes from Nanette or begins with Nanette for many of us who encountered Hannah for the first time through that program. But they can't hate Picasso because cubism. And there are many different titles that we've thought about having for this show. One of them was It's Complicated. The other was But Cubism, But Feminism. <laughs> 
We can be sure that both of those subjects will be part of Hannah's talk tomorrow night. I think that one of the really important takeaways that we are stressing and we know is important to Hannah and that we've touched upon here is that the idea of cancellation is not remotely the point of this exhibition, nor is it probably remotely most people's goals in almost anything these days as a simple reductive kind of gesture. And one of the things that museums can do is give complicated subjects the space to be complicated. And that's one of the things that Hannah's work as a comedian is all about. And I think that's one of the places where we've come together to really revel in a lot of the nuance that particularly these women artists have brought to a conversation that has now spanned five decades and has changed the way we look at Picasso, whether he likes it or not. And as Hannah likes to say, he's not really participating, but he's there because He's dead, 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 as they say. Well, Catherine and Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's Pablomatic, Picasso According to Hannah Gadsby, is at the Brooklyn Museum in New York until the 24th of September. Previous Picasso items on this podcast include a tour of Tate Modern's Picasso 1932 show on the 8th of March 2018 and a look at his response to Old Masters on the 3rd of June 2022. Coming up, floods in Italy and Ellsworth Kelly's centenary. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. Bart Drent has resigned as Global Managing Director at Tefaf less than six months after taking on the role at the Dutch company, which owns and runs the Tefaf Maastricht and Tefaf New York Art Fairs in December. Drent previously served as the company's interim director from February until December 2022, after Tefaf's Managing Director Charlotte van Leerdam went on medical leave. In a statement issued on Wednesday, Tefaf said Drent had stepped down to focus on his long-time consulting advisory, but his resignation comes days after Artnet News posted an article which chronicled his so-called anti-woke tweets. Turkey's long-time leader Recep Tayyip Erdogan won a runoff election on Sunday to extend his rule into a third decade after a divisive campaign. Most voters shrugged off warnings from his challenger, Kemal Kilic Darolyu, that the election was a last chance to shut the gates of hell on Erdogan's authoritarian rule. Provisional results from the Sunday ballot show that the incumbent won 52% of the vote to 48%. Turkey's creative community fears Erdogan could now intensify a long-running crackdown that has intimidated Ar- artists, musicians, filmmakers and other cultural activists. Kurdish, female and gay artists feel especially vulnerable after Erdogan exploited social fissures to galvanise religious and nationalist voters. He claimed opposition parties were LGBT and labelled the country's main Kurdish bloc with five million voters terrorists. Ilya Kabakov, the artist known for philosophical and literary depictions of life in the Soviet Union and fantastical utopian visions of freedom, died in New York on the 27th of May. He was 89. An announcement on behalf of his widow and longtime collaborator Amelia did not name a cause of death. In the USSR, Kabakov had an official career as a children's illustrator but made avant-garde art under the radar in his studio in central Moscow. With other artists, he founded the art movement known as Moscow Conceptualism. He left the USSR for New York in 1987 and began working as a duo with Emilia Kanofsky soon afterwards. They married in 1992 and eventually settled on Long Island. They had major exhibitions across the world, including at Tate Modern, the Centre Pompidou and the Museum of Modern Art, New York. You can read all these stories and much more on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Christie's in Milan invites you to trace the depth and breadth of creativity throughout history with their online auction, Centuries of Beauty, a refined private collection. Open for bidding until the 7th of June, this fantastic grouping spans Old Master to 20th and 21st century paintings, 18th century Italian sculpture, Maiolica, Italian and French furniture, as well as Chinese and Southeast Asian bronzes, a joyful embodiment of the art of collecting. Looking ahead to late June, the focus will shift to London, as Christie's prepares for its 20th, 21st century art summer auction season. Over 100 years of creativity, innovation and art will be presented across four live and online sales from the 21st of June to the 5th of July. Discover all this and more at christies.com. Welcome back. 
Now, the scale of the damage to heritage following devastating floods last month in central Italy, and particularly in the region of Emilia-Romagna, whose major cities include Bologna, Parma and Modena, is becoming clearer. Georgia Maloney's right-wing government has announced emergency measures that will be partly funded by a one euro increase to tickets to Italian museums, a measure that has proved controversial. To find out more, I spoke to James Imam, our correspondent in Rome. James, just remind us of the details of the floods, the damage, etc. Yeah, these um, have been pretty devastating floods. They led to 15 deaths, 36,000 people were displaced, and entire towns and cities, mainly in Emiri Romagna, were completely flooded. That led to an emergency crisis where the main concern was making sure that displaced people were safe. That very, very quickly morphed into a health crisis. So we had basically sewers overflowing and uh, and flooding cities with sewage. And it's been all hands at the pump really to try and overcome this crisis. Heritage protection has also come into play. Efforts really seem to have ramped up in the last week or so to make sure that uh, flooded museums, libraries, churches can be made as safe as possible and that the objects kept within can be saved. Italy obviously has an extraordinary wealth of great heritage. How does Emilia-Romagna fit in with that? Is is it an area particularly rich in cultural heritage? Yeah, Emilia-Romagna is full of uh, historic medieval towns, each of which have their own uh, very important objects. Uh, Perhaps the most impressive of of these towns, and there are many, Forli, Cesena, uh, Rimini, perhaps the most impressive is is Ravenna, which is famed for its UNESCO Byzantine uh, mosaics. In fact, that is a town that perhaps caused the most alarm in terms of potential heritage damage. A couple of weeks ago, it looked like a series of rivers in that area were about to seriously flood and potentially flood the entire town. And uh, there was an emergency effort over that weekend uh, to to make sure that didn't happen. So that involved doing some pretty ingenious things. I mean, for example, there's an irrigation canal 135 kilometers long that goes right along Emilia-Romagna. That risked flooding and and then flooding the town. Uh, They decided to put pumps along the canal and for the first time in its uh, history, reverse the flow of the water, push the water back into the River Po and try and make sure that uh, the town would be safe. Farmers also opened up their their fields and allowed their fields to be flooded, destroying their crops to try and sort of lower the general risk. Lorries were dumping huge mounds of earth on plastic sheets to try and barricade the city. So yes, Ravenna is rich with heritage. The whole of Emilia Germania is rich with heritage. It seems that Ravenna was largely saved. Right. The major flood that I'm, I would imagine lots of our listeners know about was 1966. We've done features and features on it in the art newspaper. It's an extraordinary moment in, in Italian cultural history. Do you think some of these efforts that you've been describing there were sort of generated in response to those catastrophic floods back in the 60s? I would say absolutely yes. Unfortunately, we have seen similar scenes. We've seen historic libraries completely flooded, people having to save, you know, historic manuscripts, dry them out, try and preserve them in some way. But I would say perhaps the emphasis that's been put on on the preservation of heritage, perhaps, has been conditioned by that. There was a really interesting figure which was released by ISPRA recently, which is the Meteorological and Environmental Agency in Italy, that said 23% of um, historical cultural heritage in Italy is at risk of being damaged by floods. So I think there's perhaps a growing awareness of not only how rich the heritage is in in certain parts of Italy, but how much at risk it is and how expensive it can be to save it and clean it up after things like the floods in 1966. And also, of course, with climate change, one imagines that that will become more and more urgent. But of course, the government is sort of effectively a climate emergency denying government, isn't it? So how does that square with it? Yeah, it's a slightly odd one. I mean, there are voices within within the government. I'm thinking specifically of a guy called uh, Loro Brigida, who's the agriculture minister, who've spoken out about climate change. They've sort of said, we're not going to have our development curtailed by having to cut our, our carbon emissions, that sort of thing. I think the government response to this has been fairly sensible. So basically, as soon as we had the floods, you know, the next day, the government was coming out sort of saying they were going to devise an emergency infrastructure project to build dams and canals and all sorts of things to make sure that towns would be safe in the future. They're saying the right things. Having spoken to geologists, engineers, all sorts of people about this, I think there's a little bit of scepticism about how viable these grand projects really are. 
there's been a lot of criticism over past governments for not doing enough to make sure that these floods didn't happen. Apparently, the infrastructure project that was recently announced, according to one geologist I spoke to, would cost about 30 billion euros. She said that in the last 20 years, Italy spent about 6 billion euros on creating its uh, its flood defences. It's quite a common situation that governments allocate funds to doing things like building big flood defences around the country uh, and don't spend them. So the famous one was Matteo Renzi's government in 2014. They announced they'd be spending 8.4 billion euros on bolstering the country's flood defences. The government changed and the project was dropped by the next government. So I think the main question here is whether or not the government is going to be able to overcome its inherent short-termism to invest the funds that are necessary to shore up the country's flood defences. Right. So in terms of like the damage, would you say that there has been widespread damage but no absolute catastrophes from these floods, heritage-wise? Heritage-wise, I would say absolutely widespread. So the Culture Ministry quite recently launched a big survey of, of the damaged areas in, um, in Emilia-Romagna and, and the Marquis regions with the help of the regions. Uh, on Friday, they updated their figures and they said 75 historical buildings had been damaged, six archaeological sites, 12 libraries. So quite widespread. It's difficult, I think, at this stage to say quite how drastic damage those individual sites are. I mean, some of them are fairly important sites. The Manfrediana Library in Faenza, which is an 18th century structure full of historical manuscripts that apparently is submerged in a meter of, of, of water. The Museo della Cappuccina in Bagna Cavallo that has had its basement completely flooded. That basement contains medieval frescoes. So I think there are some fairly critical sites and we're still at the stage now where we're trying to assess exactly what that damage is. Right. Some of the people that assess that damage are these world leading experts in sort of heritage crises, right? Because because Italy has them relatively frequently, one would say. Yes. Uh, Italy has this task force known as the Blue Helmets that swoop into crisis areas, whether it be when an earthquake has happened, or there's been a flood and um, overseas efforts to first of all save and then do the emergency work on restoring work. So they were deployed on Friday there on the scene and uh, funds have been made available by the culture ministry as well to allow them to do their work. So let's talk about the funding then, because there is this initiative and it's caused quite a controversy by the sounds of it. So a one euro price hike on museums. Tell us more. Yes. So Italy announced a few days ago a, a big two billion euro package. So this is the government and it was a general package aimed at helping people in those displaced areas. So all sorts of things, handouts to individuals, to businesses, tax breaks. Along with that, an initiative proposed by San Giuliano, the culture minister, was also announced, which was the idea that tickets to state-run museums would be increased by one euro. It has caused a bit of controversy. I spoke to a professor, Professor Volpe, last week, who spoke out quite strongly against this initiative. And he was basically saying that this is an initiative that's, that's, that's going to discourage Italians from going to museums. He said museum visits among Italians are already pretty low. Less than a quarter of Italians visited museums last year. So he said we absolutely should be coming up with finding funds to specifically help cultural workers and, and to help save cultural heritage as well, which is what these funds are going to be destined for. But we shouldn't be doing it in this way. Interestingly, another outspoken critic of this policy is somebody from within the government itself. And that's Vittorio Sgarvi, who's another person we've spoken about on this programme before. Yeah, it's a deeply controversial reactionary art critic, effectively. Absolutely. Who, for some reason, has been made one of the undersecretaries in the culture ministry and has proceeded in the last seven months of this government to shout down his minister at any opportunity, it sometimes <laughs> seems. But um, no, he's also understandably very critical of this policy. I think that's partly due to the fact that one of his flagship policies, something he's really been fighting for, is the idea of making museums free to Italians. And he won't let that go, despite the fact that the minister San Giuliano has, has said that that's not realisable and we're not going to be making museums free to Italians. So Sgarbi has also said this is an irresponsible policy that we absolutely shouldn't be pursuing. Yeah, we should say it's for three months between June and September. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Right. It's a temporary measure. 
Okay, but you're right to point out Scarby's view, but also just the rhetoric around the election, the promises that were made at the time that Giorgio Maloney's government was elected about making culture available to the widest possible community in Italy. And this seems counter to that, doesn't it? Yeah, that's an interesting point. There has been a lot of rhetoric, I think, about what museums should be doing and to what extent they should be serving Italians rather than than tourists. I mean, so far, I don't see a massive change so far in position and in approach to the previous ministry, which was run by a guy called Dario Franceschini, who was famed for overhauling, basically, Italy's museum system, bringing in some really major reforms. I mean, so far, I don't see a huge difference in, in his approach. We might be seeing differences on the horizon because, of course, one of Franceschini's big policies was that he wanted to bring in foreign museum directors to open the talent pool, really broaden the talent pool and uh, bring in big dogs from abroad. San Giuliano hasn't really made it explicit what his intention is, but I mean, the signals seem to suggest that the next bando, as they call it in Italy, the next tender, perhaps is going to make it a little bit more difficult for foreigners to take over those those museums. So perhaps we are about to see perhaps a, a slower transformation, perhaps, in the way things are done. That isn't confirmed. I think it's worth underlining. But, you know, there are sort of voices suggesting that San Giuliano may be less keen on on employing foreign directors, which, of course, would help the government sort of push its Italy first agenda or ties into that narrative somehow. Indeed, it does. While you're here, I wanted to talk about something which does seem to be clear effect of the Georgia Maloney government's this particularly hard line on immigration, you know, their origins in far right movements and so on in relation to the Venice Biennale. Now, it sounds like several African people who were invited to take part in the Venice Biennale were unable to attend because of strict immigration laws. Can you tell us more about that? Yes. So three Ghanaian professionals who were meant to be participating in the Biennale were denied visas. And for that reason, they're not able to participate in the exhibition, the Architecture Biennale, which opened on the 20th of May. Hmm. which caused a bit of um, an uproar. I think news first broke when Ollie Wainwright, who's The Guardian's architecture critic, retweeted what appeared to be a letter from Leslie Loco, who's the Ghanaian Scottish curator of the Biennale this year. He sort of, yes, retweeted a letter she appears to have sent to an an architecture journal in which she made it clear that these Ghanaians had been denied visas. And what appears to have happened is that the ambassador to Ghana, Daniele Dorlandi, decided that they should be given visas. Um, I wrote to, to the ambassador and she responded with a fairly full response and, and said basically that these professionals didn't meet the, the strict criteria that were required for, for visa applicants from Ghana. I think the response from Loco is that she can see no reason as to why they shouldn't have been granted visas and that perhaps we're dealing here with the political move. And in her words, we're dealing with an ambitious young politician who's wanting to make a name with the right wing government and chose to do so in this particular way. Right. And it's curious also that Leslie Locker has been sort of attempting to play it down to a certain extent. She doesn't want it to cast a shadow over the entire Biennale. But if you're doing a Biennale, which very much has a focus on Ghana and other African countries, and this sort of thing happens, it really does shine a spotlight on Georgia Maloney's government's policies on this wider issue of immigration in Central Europe. Yes, so I think inevitably this has become a big story. And interestingly, in the press conference at the start of the Biennale, she sort of acknowledged that uh, this is now headline news, but we don't want it to take over the narrative completely, which was interesting. I wonder whether or not she might have been reined in by the Biennale, because I had a really tough time trying to get uh, Loco to, to comment on the matter and the Biennale as well. Loco's collaborators at the African Futures Institute agreed to respond to my questions, but never did. I mean, understandably, it was at a very busy time right before the opening of the exhibition. And the Biennale as well, the press office is usually quite responsive. Uh, it was literally impossible to get through to the press officer who knew what uh, we wanted to speak about because we had exchanged emails about the incident and the Biennale had written a statement that they shared with me on an earlier occasion. But my impression was that as I tried to dig deeper, they were quite keen to make sure that the the story didn't really get out of hand and didn't overshadow Loco's main message, which I think is about the importance and the richness of African architecture and that of the African diaspora. Well, it's a very worrying story, but James, thank you for updating us. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
You can read more about this story on the website or the app. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. This week, on the 31st of May, the great abstract painter Ellsworth Kelly, who died in 2015, would have been 100 years old. To mark his centenary, a host of museums in the US are staging exhibitions and displays. Among them is Glenstone in Potomac, Maryland, which is staging a 70-work retrospective. It includes the 2014 work Spectrum 9, and the assistant curator at the museum, Yuri Stone, told me more about the painting. Yuri... Ellsworth Kelly made this painting in 2014, which means that it must have been one of the very final paintings he made. Yeah, well, it was certainly the last Spectrum painting that he made. He started the Spectrum series in 1953, and he made nine paintings in that series over those years. And this is the last one he made. It's Spectrum 9. Right. Tell me why he kept coming back to it, because if you look at the very first image, which is in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, and this painting, effectively he's trying to do the same thing. So tell me why he kept coming back to it. What was that impulse about? Yeah, in many ways, the Spectrum series is sort of quintessential Kelly. I mean, if we're going to start from the very beginning, let's say in the late 40s, 1949, when he was spending time in Paris, he was in Paris from 1948 to 1954, six years of incredibly sort of transformative work. And he returns back to that time period and some of the ideas that he sort of discovered during that period. Not only the ideas, actually, a lot of the collages that he made during that period, even, you know, 30, 40, 50 years later, he rendered his paintings. And so making the first Spectrum painting in 1953 when he was in Paris, well, I guess we should probably go back to 1949 and Window, Museum of Modern Art Paris, which is really a turning point for him. And in 1949, he actually tells the story of going to an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in Paris, and that he was more taken by the windows and the architecture of the building than the paintings that were hanging on the wall. So he comes back to the studio and he makes this artwork, Window, Museum of Modern Art Paris, where he combines two monochromatic canvases and a black wooden frame, and he sort of recreates these windows from the museum. And it's then that he sort of takes as part of his premise this idea of distilling his observations his surroundings into their most sort of fundamental forms, whether it's architecture, whether it's the shadow uh, underneath a bridge, whether it's, yeah, shadows being cast from a handrail on a set of stairs. And I think of the Spectrum paintings as doing something very similar, but doing it with color. Um, So taking one of the most sort of fundamental aspects of how we see the world, you know, color, and distilling it into the Spectrum, the series of that first painting, he said it's it's actually one panel, but subsequent um, paintings would be a series of 12 or 13 panels joined together, each having its own distinct colour. It's curious that he sort of talks about it in the sense of, you know, he wanted to make a kind of rainbow, but he didn't want that direct reference to that sequence of colours in the rainbow because he wanted this kind of almost a void in the middle of the spectrum painting. So you have the purple and the blues in the middle of the painting. Yeah, you know, it's funny. There's a lot of different ways to talk about this painting and there's a lot of different ways to talk about the spectrum series in general. You know, you could talk about it like I just did in sort of the context of Kelly's life and work and his interests and, you know, what his sort of ambitions were in terms of thinking about abstraction. But you could also talk about this painting in a purely visual way. You know, we could talk about going all the way back to, you know, Newton's color theory and Roy G. Biv and the rainbow. And actually, you know, Newton actually wasn't really guided by science when he developed this theory of the rainbow. Actually, it has a relationship to music. But, you know, we could also talk about the Munsell color chart, which actually was important for Kelly when he was in, um, in school. And the Munsell chart uses 10 colors. We could also, of course, talk about it, uh, I think like you mentioned, the sort of 12 spectral colors, the primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. And yet, for me, the spectrum paintings, they're not hierarchical um, like that color wheel might imply. We could talk about the optical nature of, of these paintings. You know, each panel, for me at least, sort of has its own curvature. You know, it reminds me of like a Roman column, you know, where you know, each panel has its own curve. And yet, you know, all of one consistency across all nine spectrum paintings is that they begin and end with yellow. And so on one hand, it's sort of this container for the painting. And yet it also sort of implies a a circular nature, you know, that the painting sort of resolves itself in some ways. 
in the San Francisco painting, they're the same yellow at either end. In the Glenstone painting, they look like different yellows, but are they the same? They don't look the same to me, but I think the other reason why the Spectrum series is so interesting is because it's the same premise for all nine paintings, and yet they take very different forms, and yet each color is unique. I could go off on a tangent about, you know, (laughs) so much of Kelly's work, especially early on, was about the sort of taking the eye out of his painting, a certain anonymity. And yet over a career of 70 years, you know, when you stand in front of a Spectrum painting, there's no question as to who made it. And yet they're all so similar, but they take many different forms. So the work that's on view at Glenstone right now is, oh, it's roughly almost nine feet by eight feet, so not a perfect square. But, you know, the that first Spectrum painting is much smaller. Um, but then he's also made many Spectrum paintings where there's separation between each panel. I think maybe uh, one of the largest is at the Met, where it spans almost a hundred foot wall. And, and actually that negative space in between the colors, you know, has an incredibly different effect than, you know, the 12 panels that make up the Spectrum 9 that's at Glenstone. And so in that way, too, it almost becomes emblematic of Kelly's practice. It's this very simple premise, but he executes it very differently over a long period of time, and he returns to these same ideas over and over again. You know, and not only is each painting unique, but each color within each painting is unique. So it's important to note that you know, he mixed all of these colors by intuition. You know, he mixed them by eye. There's a lot of questions about color theory in relation to folks like Joseph Albers. And I think Kelly was actually quite proud that his relationship to color was actually very personal. And so I go back to this idea where, you know, he said in the late forties that, you know, his works were to be anonymous and unsigned and that he was gonna take himself out of his work. And yet, you know, this is sort of one of my favorite contradictions within his practice is that they become incredibly personal and they become incredibly particular. You know, abstraction, we think of abstraction as, you know, kind of these universal ideas. And yet for Kelly, again, that he sort of pushes back on that. And every color is particular. Every form is particular. Eva Lambois talked about this beautifully, that Kelly sort of removed a certain editorial license and took these things from the world and distilled them, whether it's flattening whether it's taking sort of an elemental color and, and he renders them almost, you know, just as he's found them or, or seen them, you know, in his surroundings. And I love the fact that it seems to me that Ellsworth lived his life going from one epiphany to another about colour in the sense that, you know, he's talked about the influence of just watching birds in a landscape and, and how seeing a flash of colour of a particular bird or he's talked about, you know, colours combined in a woman's scarf or these incredibly precise moments that he sees and then takes to the studio and then transforms, if you like, into a painting. You know, I I think some of the greatest artists are ones that are just attuned to the world around them in ways that most of us, as we go through our day, don't necessarily pick up on. I think there's an element of curiosity there. And I think there's an element of sort of intentionality in terms of how you're going to move through your day, how you're going to move through your day with intention. And, you know, maybe you see a stamped paper cup on the ground. And for Kelly, it wasn't about recreating that stamped paper cup with as much detail as possible, but his sort of perspective and his relationship to this found object and how he might render it for himself and whether that's on a much larger scale and maybe it's in weathering steel and but this inspiration from the everyday and actually the totally overlooked, there's something really beautiful about that. I talked about the different ways that we could think about this painting, whether it's in sort of an art historical context, whether it's reading it sort of visually or optically, but it shouldn't be forgotten that the other way you could read this painting is, I hesitate to say, sort of from an emotional perspective. You know, when I see this painting, I, I think about joy. You know, I think about possibility and potential you know, sort of the infinite nature of color. I think for Kelly too, I mentioned that his relationship to color is one that's hierarchical, like, you know, primary, secondary, or tertiary. He said that he loved all colors equally. I love that. And I think you can see that in his spectrum paintings, that it's this real sort of obsession with color. And, you know, most of these spectrum paintings, if not all of them, have studies that came before them and his sort of experimentation with color and how he hones and tunes the color. You know, he talked about color as having three elements. There's the hue, which is the name of the color. There's the value, which is its relationship to black and white and gray and that sort of scale. And then there's the chroma, which is sort of the intensity of the color. And so at least in the spectrum painting that's at Glenstone, and I think most of them, the chroma is turned all the way up 
You know, these paintings have such a punch to them. You stand in front of a painting like this and it really feel, you can really feel the painting. Absolutely. Which is a really unique relationship to color, especially if you think about Kelly's relationship, you know, as an American artist and what was going on in America in terms of abstract expressionism when Kelly was in Paris. You know, you think about folks like Pollock and de Kooning and Rothko and Frankenthaler and, and the palettes that they're using in relationship to this, you know, chroma that's turned all the way up. And that's how you get, you know, these rich, you know, deeply saturated tones that you find not only in Kelly's spectrum paintings, but, you know, throughout all of his work. Indeed. And you mentioned about standing in front of them and, and he was emphatic about the importance of seeing his work in the flesh, wasn't he? And, you know, he even, he even sort of said, I mean, it must have been really fraught for him producing books because I know that he said that when you look at them in reproduction, often they look like postage stamps. There's something that flattens about them. But standing in front of an Ellsworth Kelly, it really is something else, isn't it? Well, you bring up another way that we could read this painting, which is sort of its context as it's hung on the wall, which, like you said, is very important to Kelly. And I think... For me, at least, going through the exhibition at Glenstone, we have on view over 70 works. It's a, it's a survey. It's one of the first sort of comprehensive surveys of his work since the exhibition at the Guggenheim in 1996. So we start with the Window Museum of Modern Art Paris in 1949 and some of his early works. And you move through the exhibition. It's, it's somewhat chronological, though there's galleries dedicated to um, his drawings um, and his photography. But Spectrum 9 is hung in the last gallery. And I think of it as important, not only in the context of the exhibition, but more broadly in the context of a museum like Glenstone. Our mission is to seamlessly integrate art, architecture, and nature. And to be able to place a painting like Spectrum in a gallery that is almost exclusively lit by natural light and situated on 300 acres of woodlands in rural Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. You brought up the fact that, you know, Ellsworth talks about as a child being given a, a bird book by his, his grandmother and his mother and, and seeing a bird in his backyard with just a, a burst of red on its wing. And as the bird sort of flees into the, the pine trees, he said that he wasn't inspired by other artists, but that was his abstraction, you know, that burst of red on the on the wing of the bird. And so as a visitor maybe sees spectrum and again, you know, the, the color palette can be read as maybe industrial or, you know, seen and in, in not necessarily tied to landscape or the natural world. But as you leave the museum and you walk through a meadow, all of the color that's embedded in that kind of natural landscape and, you yeah, know, whether it's birds or or the, the other sort of bursts of color that you encounter as you're moving through and around the museum. You know, all of this, I think, comes back to Kelly's interest in color and how the sort of infinite permutations of it and, and how it exists in our world, you know, in the same way that architecture might or in the same way that a shadow, you know, being cast through the branches of a tree might. All of these colors, you know, are, also exist in our everyday. That's right. Finally, it's, it's his birthday today. It's Ellsworth Kelly's 100th birthday as we're talking on Wednesday, the 31st of May. So it seems appropriate to have chosen this work. You mentioned the term joy earlier on. It is an utterly joyous thing to look at, isn't it? I think of it almost like a release at the end of the exhibition, you know, as you're moving through and sort of charting his history and his life and his work. And you come to this sort of final moment in the exhibition in the same way I was talking about this painting in some way sort of encapsulates his his practice or is sort of emblematic of one of his core concerns, this idea of pure color. At the same time, for me at least, I let this painting wash over me. You know, I get lost in this painting. It's so simple, these 12 colors, but it's mesmerizing in a way. And I think that joy that we're talking about is also in this, this idea of possibility. It's in this idea of potential and the way that, you know, this artist is seeing the world and he's distilling it into these very simple colors and yet none of the colors are an exact color they're all sort of variations of color and i think it's in that and their relationship to one another that lets you sort of stand in front of it in awe and it brings a smile to your face yuri thank you so much for joining us yeah it's my pleasure thank you so much Ellsworth Kelly at 100 continues at Glenstone in Potomac, Maryland in the US until March 2024. And you can find out more about the centenary at ellsworthkelly.org slash centennial.
And that's it for this episode. You can find us on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Julia Mahowska and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Catherine and Lisa, James and Yuri. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.